Tonight we are concluding the series that we've been looking at on um, the uh, apologetics of of the New Testament. And uh, I know for some of you uh, that you have thoroughly enjoyed it. I know some of you have been bored with it. I understand that very easily. I'm a person that becomes bored real easily. And so I'm ready to move on. Uh, But tonight, I think uh, you'll enjoy this fourth program. I went over the third program. We're not going to watch that program because we went over all of that a couple of weeks ago. But tonight is this fourth program, and I think it really ties together uh, what you uh, need to hear. And I think you will enjoy this. But uh, next Wednesday night, we'll begin a new study of things. And so uh, thank you for your patience during these weeks on this. Uh, because this is something that I think has been a vital study. Some have wanted uh, a study of this, and for those that have, I know you have uh, enjoyed it. And for the rest of us, we've endured it. Uh, But I do appreciate it that you uh, have come uh, to listen to this, because uh, it definitely is something that is challenging in our world today. These guys are seminary professors, and, and uh, they have, uh, you know, the, these um, uh, sessions have primarily been more like a seminary course, uh, but if you've gleaned anything from the study, then I think it has definitely been worthwhile uh, to at least see why we have the canon of the scripture that we have. So without any further ado, Brent, if you'll start the video, this is program number four in the final in this series. Welcome to our program. We're going to talk about conversation stoppers that have been introduced into our society by books, TV specials and uh, other ways, scholarly books and so on, so that when you talk about Jesus, all of a sudden somebody says, well, what about this? And we're going to talk about those questions that are listed in our society today that are out there all over the place. And uh, we've got two of the world's best scholars right here. Dr. Daryl Bach has been on almost every historical Jesus special that you've got on the networks. And uh, he is professor of New Testament research at Dallas Theological Seminary and the author of, of just a ton of books, just, just great. And they've written a new book, Dethroning Jesus, and his cohort in that was uh, Dr. Daniel B. Wallace, who is uh, one of the leading authorities on textual criticism in the Greek manuscript copies of the New Testament. He's also the director of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, the senior New Testament editor of the Net Bible, and has written the Greek grammar beyond the basics and exegetical syntax of the New Testament. Daryl, tell me a little bit more about these conversation stoppers because you actually coined the phrase. Conversation stopper is something that, uh, that stops a conversation when you go to talk about Jesus. You start to talk about him and someone has heard something on a television special, they've read it in a book, that is kind of, it isn't about the Bible per se, it's about what's going on around the Bible or something that's a supposition to how the Bible's put together. And so they raise this question, and if you don't have any background to answer the question, the conversation stops. You'll never get to Jesus. You'll never talk about what you had hoped to talk about because this stops the conversation. Our hope has been that in this series of programs, that you have gotten the answer to these questions. So it's kind of a review, if you will, because all professors love to review. Uh, Quiz. All right, right. that's right. Take out a piece of paper and number to 10. Here they come. We've got 10 questions for you (laughs) that are conversation stoppers. Yeah, all right, number one. I mean, this goes back to the Da Vinci Code. If they go into Barnes & Noble or any uh, secular bookstore, they will find a ton of books over on one side that have something like uh, the Gnostic Bible, uh, the Lost Gospels of Christianity, you've got the Book of Thomas, you've got the Gospel of, of Peter and Mary, and people look at all of this, and it revolves around the question that Dan Brown put into his Da Vinci Code, what about all those other Gospels that never made it into the Bible? And he went and said, well, you know, there were 80 other Gospels and only four were chosen. Start me off. 
Well, and the way this is usually formulated is, is that, at least the way Dan Brown said it is, is that Constantine was responsible for that choice. Constantine did not have schmatz to do with the canon. A technical okay? word. That is a technical word. It means nothing. N-O-T-H-I-N-G. <laughs> okay, he didn't have anything to do with this process. Um, the books that didn't make it into the New Testament uh, didn't make it into the New Testament because either the theology was different than the regular fay that we've been talking about on the shows, this core orthodoxy that's moving through even before we get to the recognition of the canon and that we can see in doctrinal summaries and in hymns and in the sacraments. Uh, or, or they uh, are too late. It's, in some cases, it's actually both. In fact, in most mm -hmm. cases, it's actually both. Uh, and, and so they never, they never had a chance to get in because they did not reflect the faith, not of the fathers, but of the faith of the apostles in Jesus. And, and so they never, they never made it in. There weren't 80 of them, okay? Uh, I think Dan mentioned uh, a number of about 45 earlier. It's, it's in the high 30s, low 40s is the number of what we actually have in our hands. So it's almost half what uh, Dan Brown uh, suggested. Uh, and, and there wasn't any dispute about most of these works. The, the one work that comes the closest is a gospel called the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is a hybrid gospel. It, it probably has some content that may go back to the earliest traditions tied to Jesus. If you read the Gospel of Thomas, 25% of it you read and you go, boy, that looks familiar. Well, the reason it looks familiar is it's saying something very much like Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. You read another 25% and you go, that sounds sort of familiar. And it sounds sort of familiar because it's sort of like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then there is the 50%. I've never heard or seen that before. And that's because you've never heard or seen that before. <laughs> that's new stuff. It's coming from somewhere else. And so the Gospel of Thomas is a hybrid gospel. It's an early second century gospel. And because it has some overlap with the synoptic gospels, it's gained a lot of attention. But Origen told us in the early third century that the Gospel of Thomas is not read in the churches, which is a way of telling us it was not viewed as Scripture. Let, let me add, too, that Dan Brown argues that these Gospels emphasize the humanity of Jesus, not His deity, which is exactly the opposite of what we see. The vast majority of these extra-canonical Gospels are putting an emphasis on His divinity or His uh, other-than-human aspects. They did not view Him as fully human. You've got one that says, I saw Jesus and his footprints never left, or his feet never left any prints in the sand. That kind of a statement. This is some, someone who's uh, superhuman. He's not really quite human the, at all. In, in fact, there's only one Christian group that does not uh, affirm the deity of Jesus that I'm aware of. It's the group that was known as the Ebionites. They were so Jewish they couldn't admit to the deity of Jesus because they thought only God the Father could be God. That's the only group out of all this material. So Dan Brown's reason is dead wrong. And, mm -hmm. and uh, at what we have had with Jesus from the very beginning is a high view of Jesus, which is interesting in light of what Jesus Sanity wants to make of Jesus, which is they want him to not be divine. That doesn't fit in with the ancient evidence. What's the difference between Jesus Sanity and Christianity? Jesus Sanity is the idea that Jesus is teaching matters, that he's a prophet, that he can be respected for that reason, but his person does not matter to the program of God or to the nature of the Christian faith. Christianity is that Jesus is the anointed one and his person is at the at the center, at the hub of what God is doing and that his person is very much relevant to what Christianity is. Orthodox Christianity has always been Christianity. I know this one, next one is, uh, is one of your favorites. And it's, unfortunately, it is still on the table today. We probably will see specials up ahead that have this thing, this theme. Question is, don't you know that history is written by the winners? And now that we can hear the losers, Gnostic Gospels, we need to revise the Bible's story. And this is an interesting one because generally speaking it is true that the history that survives is the history that comes from the people who win. Uh, and it is true that we've gotten our hands on a lot of material now that we didn't have before and that does fill out the picture of our understanding of history. All that is true. But here's what is false in the implication. That revision, what we have learned from what we have dug up, does not require that the traditional understanding of Christianity as being rooted in the apostles and being rooted in Jesus needs a significant change. Nor does it change the fact that this Gnostic Christianity or this Christian Gnosticism is really a 
um, a deviation from historical Christianity that grew out of Judaism. Those two cardinal facts are not altered by what we have found. And the interesting thing, too, is that Christianity is actually a work that's written by the losers, okay? If you looked at the time when Christianity was, was, going, was flourishing and beginning to grow and where it sprouted, I'd say the Romans were doing pretty well. <laughs> yep. All right, let's take this next one. And uh, there's just a fascination with this question. Didn't Jesus marry, uh, marry Magdalene and have a daughter in France? Do I take that one? Oh, I'll let Daryl take that All one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's so easy, we'll let him answer that one. It's so silly. <laughs> this, is, this is one I like to have fun with. Because uh, when, when this question was initially raised, well, it was initially raised in a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail, a long time ago, but it was re-raised by the Dan Brown special. And it's been resurrected in a varied form uh, in some of the stuff that happened with the Jesus tomb. But uh, this was one that BeliefNet.com asked uh, myself and John Dominic Crossan to tackle because I was a conservative and he was a non-conservative and they had a thing on their, on their website called SmackDown, which is kind of like Worldwide uh, Wrestling Federation except on theology. I know it's a horrible image. Don't think about who's in the white trunks and who's in the black trunks. <laughs> but anyway, so they had us do this SmackDown and the expectation was the conservative would take one position and the liberal would take another position. Well, in fact, what happened is, is that I argued that, G that Jesus was never married and that there's no historical evidence for it. And John Dominic Crossan, the liberal, argued that Jesus was never married and they never had evidence. There was no smackdown, okay? It was a love fest. <laughs> and, and I tell my students that when you can get liberal and conservative historical Jesus scholars to agree about something, it doesn't happen very often, but when it does happen, it's probably true. The fact is there is no good, solid, evidence anywhere that Jesus was married to anybody, much less Mary. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the rest of these questions. We're going to start off with, didn't they find the bones of Jesus in a suburb of Jerusalem with other members of his family? Uh, you were part of the Ted Koppel team that uh, analyzed that special. You were on the network television program. And so we're going to get your take on that when we come right back. All right, we're back. We're talking about conversation stoppers that we find in our society. Uh, questions about Jesus that stop a conversation cold, and you need to know these answers. And so let's take another one that uh, is in our society, and it came off of a, a television special not too long ago. And here's the question. Didn't they find the bones of Jesus in a suburb of Jerusalem in Talpiot? And he had other members of his family in that tomb. And uh, that goes right along with the next question. Well, you know, Jesus' resurrection was only a spiritual resurrection. It wasn't a physical, so it really doesn't matter. Let, let, me, let me take this to start with. If I okay. Can. All right. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, this is probably where I'd have a, a disagreement with Daryl. I, I think they did find Jesus' bones in the Tapia tomb. And the reason we know that, that it was Jesus is because on the left wrist there was a little wristband, and it said, what would I do? Have <laughs> 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 <Happy> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> your turn. Yeah. yeah, your turn. Yeah, what else can I say? No, seriously, the, 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 the gist of the response to the Talpiot tomb claim is that these names were too common to make anything out of it. That, first of all, the location of the tomb for being a family tomb of Jesus is in the wrong place. He lived in Galilee. Uh, he would have had a family tomb up there. So the ability to procure this tomb and do the reburial within the space of a year, keep it completely secret, et cetera, is very, very unlikely. So between the social factors that were involved in it, as well as the common nature of the names, uh, it didn't take more than a week to two weeks before almost everyone, and, I'm, and again, this is enough, conservative Christians, not so conservative Christians, secular Jews, conservative Jews, atheists, uh, I mean, this, this, this was, this, there was, was almost universal agreement in the scholarly world that there was nothing to this. You spent time with Amos Cloner right in Jerusalem, right after the special with Ted Koppel. What did he say? Yeah, Amos Cloner was the guy who was in charge of the original excavation of this site, and he basically said that that special had a mistake about every five minutes. <laughs> Tell, you met with Tal Alon, too, and tell who Tal Alon is. Tal Alon is the expert on, on names in this period and the frequency of names in this period. And she basically said when they interviewed her, she felt like a 
hostile witness uh, on behalf of defending a murderer because they tried to back her into a corner and finally they asked a question so hypothetical she had to answer it the way they wanted to, to answer it honestly, but she realized what it was that they were up to. You warned the people that uh, did the special, you warned them of the reaction and that they really didn't know what they were getting into. And uh, then you were part of the Ted Koppel special and especially one of the things you said was you say that it's only a spiritual resurrection or not a physical resurrection. This has vast implications. You don't really know the territory you're getting into. Tell us why. Yeah, this was advice that uh, the, the filmmaker uh, who was Jewish had received from his Christian consultant, a man named Jim Tabor, who does archaeological work and teaches at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. And, uh, and I said, the idea that there would be a resurrection without a physical body in Judaism is very, very unlikely. All the texts that we have about what Jews believed assumed a physical resurrection. And this is said very clearly in books like 2nd and 4th Maccabees. In fact, one of these events, one of these texts, has seven sons being killed at the same time in sequence, mutilated one after another. And when the third son goes to be mutilated, he sticks out his hands and he sticks out his tongue and he says, you can have these because one day God is going to give them back to me. That's a pretty physical take on resurrection. And so, so it's granted that the resurrection body, the glorified God, is, is pictured as being, you know, not just physical, it's not just matter, but there is something physical about it. And Paul defended that teaching and doctrine in 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, he inherited that view into Christianity from his Pharisaical background, which was rooted in the Jewish view of resurrection. So um, the idea of a spiritual resurrection uh, in the Christian faith uh, has to not only ignore the New Testament evidence, it has to ignore the Jewish roots that feed into the New Testament. Talk about 1 Corinthians 15. I mean, this is an important thing that goes right straight back to the time when Jesus uh, resurrected and uh, not too far after that. And tell them what it says. Well, the beginning has actually one of these doctrinal summaries that we've been talking about that says, you know, Jesus died according to the scriptures, that he was buried on the third day and he was raised according to the scripture, and the pictures of an empty tomb and appearances of physical raised Jesus. And Paul is honest enough to say in the midst of this chapter, if Jesus is not raised, we are the most pitied of all men, because what he's saying is we have believed in effect a lie and we've hoped for a lie. So Paul is very clear about how central an actual resurrection is to the hope of the Christian faith because part of the hope of the Christian faith is an unbroken, unceasing relationship with the living God that lasts forever and that requires a resurrection to take place. Yeah, if you just took the list of people that are in 1 Corinthians 15, which goes back how far? You mean in terms of where it popped? The date? The date, well, it's talking about appearances that happen immediately. It's Paul writing in the, in, in the mid to late 50s but it reflects his experience in the passing on of tradition that probably happened somewhere in the 30s. So we're within years of, of the actual event. And the list of people that was given to him that were eyewitnesses is over 500 people. Somebody's yeah, added it up. Even at it, one time, 500 people. Yeah. yeah. 500 people at one time saw Jesus, That's but if right. you list, put all the guys, it was 515 or something like that, if you gave them each just 15 minutes in court, mm -hmm. it would be uh, 129 hours mm -hmm. or five straight... You wouldn't straight, want to be on that jury. Five straight <laughs> days of testimony, <laughs> yeah. okay? Yeah. It'd, be, it'd be, you know, yeah. who would say after hearing 129 hours of testimony, mm -hmm. ah, nothing really happened. Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't work. All right, let's roll on to the next one. Didn't Emperor Constantine invent the deity of Christ in 325 at the Council of Nicaea? And before that, the Christians thought of Jesus like any other. That one is another one that's just simply dead wrong. Uh, and we have a letter that uh, Pliny the Younger wrote to Emperor Trajan in the second decade of the second century. Pliny was, uh, was governor of what is now central Turkey, an area called Bithynia. And he writes a letter and he's dealing with persecuted Christians. He's trying to figure out when he can if he can restore Christians that he's persecuted if they do certain things. Can he forgive them? Can, can they get clemency from the state? And he writes and he says, I've basically been told that a real Christian won't bow the knee before the statue of Caesar. And, and, and we've taken a look at their worship services. And when we go into their worship services, they sing hymns to Jesus as God, to Christ as God. It has the teaching of the worship service of the church in Turkey, miles away from Israel, in the early mm -hmm. second century. And, and so we know that the early church, vast segments of it, of course we knew this from our documents as it is anyway, 
uh, are worshiping a deified Jesus. Constantine did not put an imprimatur on that view of Jesus. Uh, let's say it this way. Christianity didn't become what it is because of Constantine. Constantine became what he was because of Christianity. I love that. Let me, let me add, if I could, that you have the biblical manuscripts themselves that on John 1.1 1, 1, we've got P66, P75, two very early papyri that are uh, uh, well over 100 years earlier than Constantine. And they say exactly what all the other manuscripts say, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So if Constantine invented the deity of Christ, that means he had to have lived in the second century. I don't think he was quite that old. <laughs> Sometimes you get a variation of the argument that says that Constantine is responsible for the makeup of the canon or something like that. But again, as we've already covered, that's not the case either. What Constantine did do is he embraced Christianity, which did give it a an open door across the, for, the Roman Empire that, that he was head of and certainly was responsible for its solidifying its position at, as the religion of, of what became Europe. There's no doubt about that. But he isn't responsible for the theological content. All right, next question. Uh, how do we know that the church scribes didn't tamper with the text? So what we've got now is what, not what the apostles wrote. Well, actually, we do know that they did tamper with the text at times. And the, the primary thing that they did in terms of changing the text was to make it more explicit. Uh, for example, in Mark chapter 6 through 8, there's 89 verses in a row in which Jesus is not once mentioned by name or title. And so the scribes had a tendency to want to add words. And so in three different places, they add the name Jesus or call him Lord so that people can understand who they're talking Especially about. Especially in lectionaries. Yeah, exactly, in lectionaries, in these liturgical books that the church would be reading week after week in terms of this is the passage you read for this week. You can't just start out with he did this, the he has to be named. So they, they did change the text, but over a 1400 year period of copying of manuscripts, the manuscripts grew only by 2%. Now that's not the kind of investment I think anybody would ever want to uh, pool in. It's, it's not going to make much money. But 2% growth of the text over 1400 years is not that substantial of a change. There are differences, that's true, but they don't affect any of these key doctrines that we're dealing with. Yeah, let's go. we got only about a minute 30 left, and that is, doesn't the New Testament disagree with itself? For example, don't Paul and Peter disagree with each other in Galatians? They do mm -hmm. disagree with one another in Galatians, but they also extend to one another the right hand of fellowship in terms of what their theology teaches. What they were disagreeing about is how Jews and Gentiles should get along. What they agreed about was the idea that Jesus taught things like the golden rule and that the faith, the faith that gathered one around Jesus meant that people had to live in a certain way. They, they, they absolutely overlap in that area. Summarize these conversation stoppers and give advice to Christians. What should they do? Well, the first thing I think Christians should do is just is, is get up to speed, if I can say it that way. This series has been designed to get you quickly up to speed, to give you some handles, to re read some good material that's out there that discusses these areas so that you're able to have a conversation. And have a conversation. Don't have an argument. Exactly. Uh, listen to where the other person is coming from when they ask their questions. In many cases, all they're doing is raising sincere questions because they've heard something on television or they've read something in a book. And so engage them, don't fight with them. You're not going to win a fight. Uh, so you want to engage them. And I think the third thing is learn to explain your Christian faith, not only in terms of your personal experience, but in terms of the historical rootage that the Christian faith has and that the Christian faith has historically left itself open for. Guys, I think it's a high privilege to be able to talk with you guys and have you as guests on the program and I know that the folks that are listening have benefited greatly from this. Thank you and thank you for your new book, Dethroning Jesus. How many of you enjoyed that one more than all the others? It's much easier, wasn't it? It was much easier with the uh, captions that were there. And uh, so hopefully you've gained something from this study of these past weeks and you have those program copies there that you uh, can go back and refer to if you need to. But at least this sort of gives us an overview of some of the ways that we can try to engage people if, if we have those conversation stoppers that, uh, that are out there. One of the things that I really noticed about uh, what they said tonight is the fact that just because you hear it on television doesn't mean 
that that's the way it is. So in a lot of those TV programs that you see and hear some of these things that are there, as you heard him say, that about every five minutes there was a misquote done in some of those documentations and, and therefore it makes it, uh, it makes it easy for people to say, well, I heard on TV and I saw and, and so you have to certainly weigh that against the truth and the evidence of what is out there. So does anybody have a question pertaining to anything that we've looked at thus far? I, I might say just a note about the uh, Southern Baptist Convention in New Orleans uh, that um, they voted yesterday. There were churches in the Southern Baptist Convention and because of the ordination of women as pastors, uh, Rick Warren's church, Saddleback in California, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention disaffiliated them from the convention because they had ordained uh, some women and one is serving as a pastor. And uh, so uh, with the uh, voting that went on that because of the Baptist faith and message uh, that did not correspond to that ordaining of women Deacons, not that women couldn't teach, but that the, um, the office of pastor, uh, according to the Baptist faith and message, but according to Scripture, should be a man uh, in that position. And so there was also a church in Kentucky that was disaffiliated uh, with that, but uh, in the voting uh, that I saw today of uh, almost... Uh, uh, to, to vote to disaffiliate, uh, there were like 9,700 plus votes, and to retain them still in the Southern Baptist Convention was somewhere around 1,000, 1,700 votes, so it overwhelmingly passed for those uh, to be disaffiliated because of the Baptist faith and message and what we believe Scripture teaches about the office of a pastor of a church. And so uh, those were some of the things that was interesting as I read a lot of what went on. I think there were a lot of discussions and lots of things that uh, happened, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they still held to the, um, the truth of what uh, Scripture had to say. Uh, I know Al Moeller, who is head of Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, he gave his... Uh, his uh, uh, statements about uh, why that we shouldn't have churches that disagreed with the um, Baptist faith and message in ordaining women to be pastors of churches. And so anyway, those Bart Berber, who, Barber, who was uh, from the Texas area pastor, he retained uh, being reelected for the second time of the Southern Baptist Convention and so uh, those are some of the highlights of uh, what I read about that today. So anybody have a question tonight before we go? Catherine, once again, it's great to see you over there. She lives now in Kansas, I believe, and uh, she was a longtime member of the First Baptist Church here in Duncan, and so I'm grateful she's in town for their school reunion, and uh, I'm grateful that she came tonight. And uh, Sue, she called me to hear you play the piano. So I'm grateful that I caught you and found you. And thanks for doing that. It's great to see all of you here tonight. Once again, to the uh, kitchen crew, thank you for the great job they've done on these uh, funeral meals we've had the past two days. And I know that they're ready to go home and get some much-needed rest. Thank you so much for doing that. God bless you for tonight. Would you stand as we pray together? And as we go, Father, we thank you for these weeks that we've had on this study of apologetics and how the canon of Scripture was put together and, and what was included and what was excluded. And I pray, God, that it would just uh, give us at least an overview and, and a handle on uh, things that if we are asked, if we are questioned, that we might be able to engage with the right spirit and the attitude about the things that we've learned. Thank you for these men. Thank you for their scholarship. 
thank you for their leadership in these uh, theological seminaries and, and through the many things that they're called on to um, uh, give comment about. And Father, we thank you for uh, uh, their uh, getting together with the Ankerberg program to uh, come up with these uh, sessions that we have had for these past weeks. God bless us in our studies together in the days to come. Thank you for this good church, your good people. Bless them in a special way, I pray. In Christ's name and all God's people said, amen.